If everybody's ready, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I don't know if everybody's here yet, but um, it is a little after six, so I guess we should get moving. So I want to thank everybody for coming to the talk. Um, I am Christina Johnston. I'm a neurologist that works at Lakeshore Health Partners. Um, I've been in town practicing for the past year, so I've sort of met quite a few patients with MS in my first year of practice, and I was asked to do a talk to the community about a common problem that I've seen so far, and MS was like the first thing that popped into my head. I thought um, there would probably be some questions and things that, um, there's been some new medications that have come out over the past few years, so I thought it would be a reasonable thing to review, just kind of do an overview of what is MS, uh, what are the symptoms of MS, how do we diagnose MS, and then some of the newer therapies that have come out over the past few years, I wanted to kind of touch base on those, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. I didn't get really, really specific about a lot of things because I knew there was going to be probably a lot of questions, so um, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for that at the end, okay? Also, I want to apologize ahead of time. I have a cough drop in my mouth because I'm getting over bronchitis, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. Um, Okay, so I have nothing to disclose. I'm independently employed. I don't work for anybody else except for LHP. So just wanted to get that out of the way ahead of time. So what is MS? What happens with MS? Um, MS is a, a chronic disease in the, that affects the central nervous system. That means that the brain, the spinal cord, and also the optic nerves, which are the nerves that project to the eye and allow us to see, can be involved in this process. Um, everyone has an immune system that normally fights off diseases such as bacteria, viruses, any sort of infection. And we think that the reason MS occurs is because there's a sort of case of mistaken identity, that the immune system mistakes the central nervous system as a foreign object or a foreign being, and it unfortunately attacks it and creates a problem. So statistically speaking, everybody likes to talk about statistics a little bit to get a general idea of um, how big of a problem this, this is in terms of our country. Um, it affects approximately, the statistics vary a little bit, but around 350 to 500,000. So um, people in the, just the United States alone. Worldwide, there's over two and a half million individuals. And they estimate that in, in the United States alone, approximately 200 people per week are diagnosed with this disease. So it is rather common, um, more so than a lot of neurologic diseases. And it's probably affected a lot of, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here in this room are affected. But even in the general community, most of us can say that we know someone or, or know of someone that has or um, a family member who's affected by MS or a friend or something. It's very, very commonly seen. Um, it typically affects males less than females. I, we don't really know, understand why that is, but the ratio is about two to three females to one male. Um, <clears throat> but that's kind of what we see. Typically, Caucasians are affected more predominantly um, than African Americans, although Caucasians, African Americans, and Hispanics are the most commonly affected. We don't always see it as much in Asians, although it can occur. Um, and there's a few other ethnicities that it's just not as common in. Um, children can be affected by this disease, although it's very rare. Um, in my training, I did see um, a few children that were affected, but mostly it occurs in our younger years. It kind of, the, the saying is that it affects a person when they're in the prime of their life, their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, when they're really, you know, doing great, they're living their life, they're having children, they're getting married, and this happens. So... Um, it tends to occur kind of in the northern areas of the world, um, the United States predominantly. And in the United States, it's even more in the upper portions of the country. As you get more south, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent. And that's the case across the world. So Europe, Japan, some of those areas are um, more often affected. Um, northern European countries specifically um, tend to have a higher predominance of MS as well. We're not really sure what that is. There's some theories about that. Um, that vitamin D or sunlight exposure could be playing a role in, in why that occurs more commonly than nearer to the equator because it's very infrequently seen in the uh, countries that are closer to the equator. Um, uh, the lifespan of a person with MS is generally about, on average, only a few years shorter than the, no the normal lifespan of a, of a typical American. So 
you know, people who are diagnosed with MS still live a full life, only they have to sort of um, deal with the symptoms and the chronicity of this disease. So we still haven't identified exactly what the cause of the disease is, but there's a lot of research. So I just put this slide in because this is, um, I found this online, and it's a picture of many famous faces who have been affected by MS. Um, I think this Terry Garr, um, Annette Funicello, who just passed away. She was 70 years old, so she lived a long time with MS. Um, Richard Pryor, Ann Romney was in the news w with the last election and kind of brought a lot of attention toward MS and raised a lot of questions about it. Um, Meredith Vieira's husband, I think Richard Cohen is his name, he's um, a famous individual who's been in the news a lot about, you know, with attention toward MS. And um, Jack Osborne was diagnosed a few years ago, so he's been in a few um, newspapers and magazines over the past year or so that I've seen. So, but it is, it does affect anybody. So, so getting into a little bit more detail about specifically what is it. Um, so everyone's brain and spinal cord are, you know, consist of nerves and the nerves are lined by a, a protective barrier called the myelin sheath. So the analogy that we use is that it's like an electrical cord with a protective, you know, insulation around the cord. And that's the case with the nerve. So what happens is that the, the normal nervous system connects the brain to the spinal cord, to the nerves in the extremities, which connects with the muscle and allows us to do things like move, walk, feel our sensation, uh, visualize the world. Um, so when the immune system attacks the, the myelin or the covering of the nerve, it creates a disruption in the signal transmission. And so the signals can't get from the brain to the leg or to whatever is affected, and it creates a problem. So. It usually um, happens when the inflammation occurs after the attack of the immune system on the myelin. So what happens with that is an attack, a clinical attack, a relapse, um, a flare, whatever term you choose to use or, or your neurologist chooses to use, but that's what it is. So it's a sudden onset of neurologic symptoms, meaning weakness, numbness, anything like that, that comes on and doesn't go away for at least 24 hours. For some people, it lasts for, you know, three, four days. For some people, it lasts several weeks. And some people, it never, I mean, it can persist longer. So typically, though, that's not the case. Typically, it's a short term, a few days, a few weeks, and then it gradually starts to improve, which is why sort of people can have symptoms, and then they get better, and they ignore it, and they don't even know that they have um, symptoms of MS. Oftentimes it happens when to a 24-year-old, 25-year-old, you know, a young person, they get better and they don't think anything of it until something happens later. So that's the classic pattern that we hear of relapsing, remitting. So a relapse followed by a remission, meaning healing and going on with normal activity. So the symptoms can come on later in life, um, usually in the, in the setting of infection, if we're stressed out, if we're tired, and it's the result of the sclerosis left on the brain, or the sclerosis just means a scar. So after the brain is attacked or there's a, um, a damage to the nerve, there's a scar that forms as it heals, but that scar doesn't have the same capacity that it had prior to its damage. So it can leave residual symptoms going forward. Over the course of one's lifetime, you can see a decline in physical activity. You can see a decline in cognitive ability. So there are some chronic components to this disease, which is what you know, leads to the disability component. Um, you know, and, and managing these chronic symptoms is, you know, that's my job. <laughs> that's what the neurologist sort of uh, manages and, and deals with on a routine basis. So I put an illustration in here, and I actually tried to put it into my slide, but it didn't work, so I'm going to actually just go to the YouTube website. It's not my video, but I found it online, and I thought it was a fantastic illustration of the pathology that I just tried to explain. Multiple sclerosis, MS, is a disease that affects the central nervous system, the CNS, which consists of the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerves. Everything we do, whether it's taking a step, solving a problem, or simply breathing relies on the proper functioning of the CNS. To understand how MS may impact the CNS, we must explore the disease at the cellular level. 
In the brain, millions of nerve cells called neurons continually send and receive signals. Each signal is a minute but necessary part of intricate CNS orchestrations that culminate in the actions, sensations, thoughts, and emotions that comprise the human experience. Normally, the path over which a nerve signal travels is protected by a type of insulation called the myelin sheath. This insulation is essential for nerve signals to reach their target. In MS, the myelin sheath is eroded and the underlying wire-like nerve fiber is also damaged. This leads to a breakdown in the ability of the nerve cells to transmit signals. It is believed that the loss of myelin is the result of mistaken attacks by immune cells. Immune cells protect the body against foreign substances, such as bacteria and viruses. But in MS, something goes awry. Immune cells infiltrate the brain and spinal cord, seek out the myelin, and attack. As ongoing inflammation and tissue damage occurs, nerve signals are disrupted. This causes unpredictable symptoms that can range from numbness or tingling to blindness and paralysis. These losses may be temporary or permanent. That was a really nice illustration of what I tried to explain, but obviously I can't do the video as nicely as that explained it. But I thought that was a good explanation sort of of what the physiology of MS is, just so you can all understand if you weren't aware already. So. Again, why does it happen? We don't really know. There's a lot of theories out there, and there's been a lot of investigations about what specifically causes it, because, for, for, like I said, it affects us in our younger age, so there's a theory that it's got to be viral. I mean, we're all exposed to varying viruses throughout our lifetime. Um, the one that's most commonly thrown out there is the Epstein-Barr virus, which many of us were exposed to in childhood. Some of us were affected and got mono from it. Some of us ha had no symptoms of it, and they think it could be... Um, contributing or have some, some role in um, making the immune system go awry and create this, this disorder. Um, as I stated earlier, vitamin D has recently become a sort of big focus of, of MS and especially in preventing relapses because we, we think that um, low vitamin D levels, low sunlight exposure, kind of that northern latitude um, thing that I talked about before, that that has some implication in, in the relapse in and the incidence of worsening disease. So there's a lot of research going on in that, and, and a lot of physicians now are starting to monitor vitamin D levels, and if they're low, which most people in Michigan have a low vitamin D level, um, we're starting to replace it and kind of get those levels up a little bit into a more therapeutic range because we think it would help. So um, genetics is also something that they're looking into. Um, it can run in families. Um, there's definitely um, a large number of you know, families that do have MS that runs in the family, but they haven't identified a specific genetic linkage. Um, I mean, I have a number of patients in my practice, in my training. I saw a lot of people that you know, their parent was um, diagnosed or they had a sibling who had been diagnosed with MS. So it, it seems like it has some sort of genetic linkage, but we just haven't really identified it yet. So MS is a broad diagnosis. There are four types of MS. The most common and the most um, significantly more common is the relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. That affects about 85 percent of people who are affected by MS. It's clearly the most common. Um, a, a much, much less common is a primary progressive multiple sclerosis. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one or any of the others because it just it's not as commonly seen but primary progressive multiple sclerosis you don't really see the relapses um, the patients who are affected by that they they get a symptom and they don't recover from it so they're continue any time that they have a new attack on their system they just continually decline but they don't have like an outward attack and then recovery so it's a little bit different and we I think it might be a little bit, um, the, the physiology of it is obviously a little different and we haven't clearly identified that either. There are not as many, there really aren't any therapies for that type of MS either and um, relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis does have a number of therapies. So I wanted to really focus on that type for this talk. Um, secondary progressive multiple sclerosis is kind of something that you see later in life in the disease process after you know, you've had it for a number of years. Um, you start to sort of not have as many relapses or not as often, and, 
and things just start to quiet down or they seem like they quiet down. But what we know about that is that um, in that stage, the relapse has become less prominent, but the disability part seems to become more evident. So the scarring on the brain that occurred earlier in life now starts to affect us more seriously. Um, and then progressive relapsing multiple sclerosis is very sort of rare, but it is a, is a condition where there's a co progressive component that can have relapses, but that, you know, you, you have a relapse, but you don't completely recover, and it's more profound than, than relapsing remitting. So it's a little tricky to diagnose. We don't see that one as often either. This is sort of an illustration of the, the types that I just described. This one at the very top here um, is called benign multiple sclerosis. That's, um, you know, it, it, we don't see that one a whole, whole lot. There's a very few people that have multiple sclerosis, but they, they com completely return back to normal and they just don't really develop disability over their lifetime. It definitely occurs, it's just not as common. Um, and we don't, we don't tend to focus on that one as much either. Those people are usually kind of grouped in with the relapsing remitting because it is so similar. There's relapses. The disability just doesn't seem to be as profound. But you can see with this, this illustration what I was trying to say is that with, with each relapse there's a sort of a peak in disability. The, the y-axis here is the disability factor. This is time. So as our lifetime goes on, there's a, a relapse and we get better. But if you notice, you don't completely return to baseline. So you may have a teensy bit of, of residual weakness or whatever your disability is. And then a few years go by and then you have another relapse. And maybe you still don't return exactly to that baseline that you were at. And as it goes on, it's just a little bit gradual progression of the disability component. With primary progressive, as I said, there's just really no relapses. There's just a continual steady increase in the amount of disability over time but you just don't see those peaks in sudden onset of symptoms. The secondary progressive form here is very similar but as I said there's just a much more you know um, uh, much less recovery to to the baseline there and it just as you get later in life too even the relapses become less prominent so and then this is the progressive relapsing so so symptoms, I mean, everybody wants to know what are the symptoms. I see so many people in my office who come and say, I think I have MS. I've been reading on the internet, I think I have MS. Please tell me I don't have MS. I can't tell you how many times I see that. And then there are the people that come and they, they possibly do have MS. So how, how do we, how, how does a neurologist know? Um, well, I mean, obviously this is a great illustration because it shows that it affects every part of the body, essentially. Um, Oftentimes, um, initial symptoms can consist of loss of vision in one eye or optic neuritis. Sudden, wake up one morning, can't see out of an eye, pain, painful vision, gradually progresses over a few days, and then after a few weeks, starts to return. That's very commonly seen as one of the initial symptoms of MS. Um, it can vary, though. I mean, some people can have episodes of, of double vision or um, sudden imbalance. But as I said earlier in the talk, the symptoms have to be sort of consistent and last for more than 24 hours. So when people come to me and say, I woke up this morning, my leg is numb, and later in the afternoon it's back to normal, that's not MS, okay? Um, certainly sensation can be affected. Um, numbness, paresthesias meaning tingling, burning, that type of thing, that can, that can definitely be MS, but it's not something that, you know, you wake up with in the morning and it's better by afternoon. That's different. Um, Weakness. Um, oftentimes the initial symptoms or later symptoms of a relapse are weakness that affects a limb. Um, you know, my arm is all of a sudden clumsier or heavier than it used to be and it's just not getting better and I think something's wrong. It's, it's a profound neurologic symptom that doesn't get better or it doesn't get better right away, okay? Um, with the spinal cord involvement, you can see things like bowel and bladder dysfunction. Um, urinary incontinence, urinary urgency, um, having to go all the time, difficulty emptying, things of that nature. Um, it can affect our swallowing, it can affect our speech, it can affect our cognition, our focus, our mood, our energy level. I mean, everyone who has MS, the most common complaint is fatigue. I'm tired, I have no energy, I have to take a nap every day because it just, it wipes you out. So these are the symptoms, but it's the way the symptoms present and the duration and, and that, 
that really helps a neurologist to, to hone in on this could possibly be an MS symptom. So as I said, when someone comes to me and they want to know how do I know if I have MS, a neurologist is going to really you know, tease through the details of the history. The history to a neurologist is the most important thing because I want to know what is happening right now, but I also want to know what has happened before. I mean, what in your earlier you know, years have you presented with or have you had and you ignored it because it got better and you didn't think anything of it? Um, the timing of it, as I said, how long does it last? How, when did it go away? Has it ever come back? Um, that's really, really critical to making a diagnosis. The neurologic exam is obviously very important um, and can only, you know, a neurologist is probably the only one who can do it very well. Um, it's a challenging thing to do. Um, the imaging of the brain and spinal cord is very important. Before we had MRI, um, MS was much more difficult to diagnose because we didn't have specific pictures where we could see the lesion or the inflammation or the attack. Um, sometimes now, less commonly, we, we still do a spinal tap to make a, an analysis of the spinal fluid and see that there's evidence of inflammation. But 30 years ago, anyone who possibly had MS got a spinal tap. Nowadays, that's not necessarily the case. MRI has significantly brought us much more um, advanced, and we don't always have to do that now. Evoked potentials, which are the visual... Um, the visual testing to see if anyone's had optic neuritis. I mean, we used to have to do those things to really solidify a diagnosis. And sometimes we didn't know. Sometimes we had to wait. Now, we sometimes may have to wait a little bit to see if there is another relapse or see if there are new symptoms that develop. But most of the time, or very, very often, we can figure it out rather quickly because our technology has advanced so much. But again, I do see people sometimes where I say, this is a clinically isolated syndrome. You have a high likelihood of developing MS based on your symptoms, based on your imaging, but it's not MS yet because there's very strict criteria that a neurologist uses. Um, and I'm not going to get into all that because it's really boring. And <laughs> so this is a typical MRI of a patient who's been affected by MS. So I have two views here. Um, this is a sagittal image and this is an axial image of a, a typical MRI. So what we're seeing here is these areas here, 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 sort of along the middle of the brain. This is the, these are the eyes here. This is the back of the head, the spinal cord starting to develop down here. So we're, as a neurologist, we look kind of along the center of the brain where MS likes to hang out. It tends to affect the portions near to the ventricle, which is this portion here, and these are the ventricles here and here as well. And in both images, you see these areas of inflammation, these bright spots on the brain, and they really like to hang out near the ventricles. We don't know why, but um, that's the sort of classic picture of what an MS brain looks like. These areas where the inflammation um, is located is probably when a relapse occurred. So we like to monitor MRIs going down the road after a diagnosis is made to monitor the progression of the disease, to monitor if the, the medication that you're on is working. Um, it really provides a lot of information. This is a picture of a spinal cord that has um, a lesion on it. So kind of just a general illustration of what we're looking for when a neurologist orders an MRI. That's why we want to get it. So what do we do for treatment? Um, there's no cure but we have significantly advanced in therapies over the last 20 years. Um, there's, at this time, still enormous amount of research in MS. Um, they, as I said, in the last three years, there's been three new therapies that have come out, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, there's a lot of drug trials going on right now. There's clinical trials. There's, you know, in the lab trials going on, and we're moving very much toward, toward um, you know, better therapies and therapies that are working much, much um, stronger at reducing relapses and minimizing disability, which is really important. So obviously, though, it's still a balancing act because we have to maintain our immune system and find a therapy that allows our immune system to be suppressed enough so that it's not going to continue to attack itself. So it is rather challenging, and that's why it's taken so long to, to get to where we are now where we have therapies available that work with minimal side effect and um, you know, that you can be on for a long, a long period of time. 
So the treatments that we do have available, obviously the acute relapses when something happens, most the, the, the mainstay is steroids. It still is. It was 50 years ago. Um, when you have an acute relapse, if anyone has ever um, had a relapse, steroids are kind of the mainstay. It ex expedites the healing process. It doesn't cure anything, but we want to get you back to your baseline as soon as quickly as possible and get you back on, back on your feet. Um, the disease modifying therapies are the ones that I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. And the symptomatic therapies, um, I'll touch on a little bit, but that's really individual. So, you know, based on what your symptoms are, there's, there's multiple th uh, treatment options, but it's sort of very individualized. <clears throat> so, in 1993 was the first um, disease modifying therapy that came out. It was beta seron. Um, it was an enormous breakthrough for MS patients because all of a sudden there was something to put to be on to reduce the relapse rate and to reduce the p potential of, of uh, progressing with disability. Um, since, since that time, so in 20 years, we've come up with eight FDA-approved disease-modifying therapies. And actually, I think there's actually nine, but one of them I didn't include because I don't see people using it much anymore because it has a lot of bad side effects. So we're kind of moving away from that one since we've gotten some newer ones. Um, uh, all of the disease-modifying therapies that are on the market um, have been shown to reduce relapses. Most of them have been shown to at least reduce the progression of disability, and many of them have uh, also been shown to reduce the, the new lesions seen on the MRIs that we, that we periodically check. So most of the, th actually all of the therapies are <laughs> generally safe, and well tolerated. When I say generally, there are a few um, significant complications with several of the therapies that we very closely monitor and we look out for, and, and we're very on top of those uh, potential risks. So we'll talk about that. Um, on average, the injectable disease modifying therapies have been shown to reduce relapses by 30%. The injectable um, have been around the longest. Um, only in the last three years are there pills available now. So most people who have had MS this long have been on injectable therapies of some kind. Um, all have an anti-inflammatory effect on the immune system. So reducing inflammation, bringing the immune system down to a more manageable level, and reducing the relapses. Um, most of the therapies require some kind of blood monitoring. There are a few that don't require as much, but there are you know, maintenance tests that oftentimes have to be done to ensure that it is safe to continue to be on. So the first category is that I'm going to talk about are the interferons. Interferons are normally present in our immune system. And beta seron is the first one that came out. It's also called Extavia. It's believed to suppress the um, movement of T cells, which are a type of immune cell, across the blood-brain barrier. So there's a, there's a wall between like the, the blood flow and the brain cells themselves. And so the, the immune cells have to sort of transpose across that and invade the brain to cause the attack. So this medication was aimed at reducing that transposition of the T cells across the, ba the barrier into the brain. This is an injectable medication every other day. It's been around the longest. There's been a lot of people who were on it at first, and then since that came out, there's a few others that have come out as well in the same category. It's approved for relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. It, as I said, reduces relapses by about 30%. So it's a pretty reasonable number. It does have the unfortunate side effect of some flu-like side effects with the injectables, but um, for, it's different for everybody. And we have you know, wonderful nurses that we you know, use to train our patients to help sort of minimize those unfortunate side effects. Um, interferon <coughs> beta-1A are the Avonex and the Rebif. This is the same medication but in a different form and a little bit different dose. So Avonex is a, is a once weekly injection. Um, it reduces relapses, as I said, by about 30% as well. All the interferons are about the same in terms of numbers. Um, it's been shown to um, slow disability progression, which beta serum did not, and also reduce the MRI um, lesions that are seen. So Avonex is once a week, Rebif is three times per week under the skin. Both have flu-like side effects, unfortunately, but as I said, 
For most people, it's usually worse in the beginning when you're starting the therapy. As you sort of get established on the therapy, the flu-like side effects do tend to dissipate, and you sort of learn how to, how to manage it. You pick a day that sort of works for you, that you're able to be a little under the weather, and still kind of go on with your day-to-day -day functioning. <coughs> with both of these medications, um, blood monitoring is required. We have to monitor the liver. We monitor this, the, the white count to make sure that you still have a good immune system and that the platelets and all those things haven't dropped. So we, we do, do periodic uh, blood monitoring with the, both of these medications. The other injectable medication is glutamic acetate or copaxone. Copaxone is a different category of medication that's not an interferon. It's actually a combination of amino acids that are believed to be found in the um, myelin, or the, um, the uh, it, it, they re resemble the myelin, and it's supposed to uh, suppress the T cells and reduce uh, inflammation. Um, it's approved for relapsing and remitting uh, multiple sclerosis as well. Um, it does also have a 30% reduction in relapse rate. Um, it has not been shown to decrease disability. Um, but it is widely prescribed. It's every day uh, under the skin. It has very minimal side effect. It has no flu-like side effect. It is tolerated by most people who, who do the injections. And it's kind, this is the one I kind of tell people it's like being a diabetic. You sort of just do your shot every day and you just go on with your, your day. So um, this is one that's been very widely prescribed. For women who want to have children, it's safe during pregnancy. This is the only one that has been shown to be safe for pregnancy. So um, for women that are in their childbearing years and affected by MS, this is one that is often used because you know, you don't have to go off of it, you don't have to go back on it. For some of these medications, it takes several months before they reach full effectiveness. So that's a nice, uh, that's a nice perk. Um, Tysabri um, is a once a month infusion. Tysabri is a very wonderful drug. When it came on the market, it was like the breakthrough. It was, I believe, 2007. I have to look that up specifically, but it may have been 2007 when it came onto the market and it was pulled from the market a year later because of an infection of the brain that was found to occur called PML. PML is a viral infection that is irreversible and it can result in death. It can result in very significant disability and it is not taken lightly by any neurologist. Um, it is a wonderful drug though in the sense that it's once a month. You go for your infusion, you go home and that's it for the month and you feel great and there's no side effect, and it's a fantastic option, but it has very specific protocol that has to be very closely adhered to. Only approved neurologists and approved centers can administer this medication. Um, you have to have very strict criteria um, with every infusion. You have to have a patient who's incredibly willing to adhere to the rules, and um, it, it is very closely uh, monitored but it has a reduction in relapses of by about 67%. So far surpasses all the other ones. It slows disability progression and reduces the MRI lesion, and it's a great drug. But I will tell you, I've seen PML, and it's not great. It's horrible. It, it, it kills people. It's, it is worse than MS. <laughs> so that's why we don't, we don't pick this for every person with MS. This is a medication that is reserved for patients who have failed other therapies and are having progression, and we need to do something stronger. But it's a great drug. Also recommended by some doctors for if MS <clears throat> patients have ulcerative colitis, yes. as I had it, mm -hmm. and they recommended that for me. It is used, yes. Mm -hmm. um, as is the case with some of these other medications that we'll talk about. So these are the new oral therapies, Jelenia, Obagio, and Tecfidera. All pills, which is awesome. No injections anymore. So, Jelenia came out in 2010. Um, it's a once a day tablet. It has a reduction in relapses of about 50%. But unfortunately, this one has um, some unfortunate cardiac side effects that we have to really closely monitor. There have been some reports of sudden cardiac death with this medication, so we have to pick patients who have no history of cardiac problems or very minimal risk risk of cardiac disease. Um, 
it has it reduces the disease progression. It reduces MRI lesions. Um, it's uh, believed to keep the lymphocytes inside the lymph nodes and prevent them from exiting to go to the brain. So that's how we think it works. Um, this one can also affect our vision and cause a macular degeneration. So that's something that has to be screened while on this medication. Um, there's a little bit of blood monitoring. You have to screen for uh, zoster or her, um, the shingles virus. But it's, um, it's a good medicine too. It's been out for three, almost three years now and there's a number of people on it and they're doing great. So that was the first one. Uh, last fall, Obagio was approved. Obagio is called teriflunamide. Teriflunamide is a, an agent that has been um, around, or um, not, not teriflunamide, um, leflunamide, which is another derivative of, of teriflunamide or similar, has been around for much longer. So we do have some information about this um, similar product and it was approved um, as a once-a-day tablet. It is believed to have anti-inflammatory properties that reduce the lymphocytes in the, in the central nervous system. The specifics of it are a little, a little sticky to me. I don't completely understand it exactly, but it's, um, it's been around and it's starting to be prescribed more commonly. Um, it has a statistic similar with the injectables, about 30%. Um, however, the big, the big fancy statistic here is that 80% less new lesions on MRI, which is, you know, a, a really important uh, factor for, for patients. This is a pregnancy category X, so anyone who's in the childbearing age range is probably not going to be a good candidate for this medication because it's very risky. Um, category X in the medical world means absolutely not, cannot get pregnant on this medication. Even males who um, could potentially impregnate their wives are supposed to be warned about this because it's been found for men also to be a problem. So we have to monitor blood pressure and we have to do a TB screen, but this is a once a day medication that is an option for people. If you're beyond your childbearing years and it's okay to be on something like this, then this is a great option. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about this one also. Um, and Tecfidera is the most recent one that just came out a few months ago. It's a twice a day medication. It has a little bit different uh, mechanism, mechanism of action. Uh, predominantly works on the antioxidant pathway, um, which is kind of a new thing. I mean, we've all, we always hear about antioxidants, and you're supposed to drink all these antioxidant you know, juices and things, but it, it, there, there is a lot of um, ongoing research in this area, so there's probably going to be more drugs in the future coming out in this area. This has a, a reduction in relapses by about 53%. Um, disability is also decreased by 38%. The side effect pro profile is pretty good. I mean, it, it does cause some flushing for people. The face, feel a little hot for about an hour or so after your dose. Tends to get better after about an hour, from what I'm told, and tends to minimize over the course of the first few, first few weeks. By the end of the first month, I'm told it's much better. Um, it can cause some upset stomach, some gastrointestinal discomfort, but it sounds like a great drug also. Very little side effect. Starting to see, I mean, I have a couple people on it now. I haven't heard a lot of bad feedback, so I've talked to some colleagues who think it's great. I worked in a center that this was a medication um, in the research trial, I, so great, great data on this one. This medication was available in Europe for psoriasis, so it's been on the market for a long, long time, and they have a lot of good data that it's safe and effective also. So this is a great option for people. So. With all these new meds, how does the neurologist choose, or how does the patient, um, you know, how do they know if they're a candidate for these new medications? Well, that's complicated a little bit. Um, you know, for patients that have been stable on their injectable medications, it's really hard to, to take them off of it right away, knowing that they're doing so well. For patients who have horrible side effects, they've been hating their Avonex, or they've been hating their Rebif, or whatever the case may be, they hate their Copaxone, and they, they just have had horrible tolerability issues for years, and now these pills are available. I mean, that's a reasonable option, but it's very individualized with each case scenario. It's, it's a different um, thought process into why would we switch. For some people, they, they do fine on their injectable medications, but they're just getting worse, and they need something different. And these are available, and they have a different mechanism of action, so it's a different way of fighting off the immune system. So that's a reason to pick it. For some people, they have no symptoms, but their MRIs are looking worse. And 
something needs to be done so that disease progression or disability doesn't occur in 10 years. So, I mean, there are a lot of thoughts that go into a neurologist's mind when we meet with you every visit to talk, to talk about your therapy. Um, it's not an easy choice. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big decision to switch therapies. And there's risk with switching therapy. And there's side effects with switching therapy. So it is very individualized. And anyone who has MS, they know all about the, the risks of medication. And it, it, it's a case-by-case -case decision. So what applies for one person doesn't necessarily apply for the next person. So what if you think you have MS? Or what if you know somebody who, that you are concerned might have MS? They need to see somebody about it. They need to get evaluated by a neurologist, somebody who is familiar with MS, who can really look into it. Um, because what we know about MS and what we've seen even bef before I was even born, I mean, I'm 31 years old, so <laughs> I mean, this has been along for, around for a long time. And you know, my trainers have been doing this for a long time. They saw people when there was nothing to do. And every year, things got worse. But now with therapy, things slow down and, and people are living longer with less disability, with more functionality. They're, no one no, needs to know they have MS because they can you know, have less and less symptoms as their lifetime goes on. And if you don't get treatment as soon as possible or as, as early as you can, then the risk of relapses increases and with that is disability. So the earlier you're suspecting symptoms, the earlier you should see somebody and, and figure it out. For people who have been diagnosed with MS and have been living with this for years, it's a whole different, you know, it's a different ball game. Um, the symptomatic therapies are, as I said earlier, very individualized. There's plenty of medications out there to treat the fatigue, to treat the spasticity, to treat the depression, to treat the bladder problems, to, you know, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that we have. And it's obviously, if one thing doesn't work, we try something else. And if, you know, something does work, we stick with it. But it's, it's, it depends on the symptom and it depends on the person. But, um, you know, that's a conversation you need to have with your neurologist. So when, when a patient with MS comes to my office and I see them and I say, how are you doing? I mean, that's the time to say, oh, my bladder's bothering me or, or I'm not sleeping well or I'm down in the dumps. I mean, because that's, that's the conversation that you should have with your neurologist is how are you doing? I mean, when, when I walk in the room and I say, how are you? that's the time. I'm great, but um, this is bothering me. I mean, that's what the neurologist needs to know. That's how we decide how to treat your symptoms and what to change and what to do differently. So physical therapy is a great option. Occupational therapy for people who have, um, you, know, you know, different, I mean, it's different for everybody, but those are great resources too. The physical therapists in this town are awesome. They're top notch. I have so many great responses from people that have gone to physical therapy for, you know, not just MS. But we have a really great um, community with wonderful resources. So I try and take advantage of that for my patients, and I always make that an option. Um, assistive devices sometimes are very helpful for, you know, foot drop or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, when upper extremities are spastic and it's hard to, you know, grab things or open jars. And it's, it's, there's things available for that. So you have to talk to your neurologist about it so that we can get, get you the help that you need. Living environments sometimes have to be changed. Living in a house that doesn't have a ton of stairs, you know, bathroom accommodations, things like that, so that we can minimize complications. Exercise is always, you know, I never tell someone not to exercise. I mean, there's, all, there's different degrees of exercise. There's different things to do. Exercise is really important. Healthy diet, good sleep, um, you know, stress, stress management's hard. Stress management is something that any doctor can preach to you and any person can preach to you. But it's, you know, I mean, every person has stress and everyone deals with it differently. But it is important because when you're more stressed, your symptoms are accentuated. And it's really important to sort of keep that under control. And if you're struggling with it, to ask for help. Support groups are great, too. Um, support groups are wonderful in the sense that they can give you someone to listen to your struggles and to also, you know, hear what other people have gone through. It's, it's wonderful. In some cases, it can make you a little nervous that, oh my gosh, am I going to be in a wheelchair? Because that's the most common fear of everybody. And, and I will tell you, it's not, it's getting better. I mean, people are doing better for longer with the advancement of medication. So I think the people that are, were in wheelchairs 30 years ago, if they were to have been diagnosed now, maybe wouldn't be in a wheelchair as soon or maybe not ever. It's, 
it's just things have changed and things have advanced and we definitely are making a lot of strides. So I put this slide in here. Um, actually, we have a handout over here with this information. So these are just some wonderful online resources. I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, but the National MS Society is a fantastic resource for helping with you know, disability benefits, for insurance, for work, for all sorts of, of questions that we face in our day-to-day -day routine when you're living with MS. Um, the MS lifelines, the MS active sources, those are both online resources that can answer questions, that can provide, um, you know, there's a mentor, there, I, I think both of them actually, MS lifelines and MS active source, have resources to talk with a mentor if you need just somebody to talk to or someone who's been there. There, there are those resources there. Um, the MS Foundation and sh uh, Shared Solutions is great because they help with, you know, in questions who are questions about injectable therapies, how to make things better if you're struggling. Um, they're, they're wonderful nurses that can provide way more uh, answers to your questions than probably I can even. So I, I use them a lot. So I don't have any more slides, and I went a little bit over. Um, there's about 10 minutes left, but I, I'll stay for any questions. So I hope that wasn't too boring or too overwhelming, but <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> The, the question was, um, I had mentioned some speech symptoms, and the question was, what would be some speech symptoms with frontal lobe lesions? Well, I suppose the, that's a complicated answer, as, as is the case with most neurology. Frontal lobe lesions, if they involve the motor pathway, can affect you know, the mechanics of the mouth, so it can make you have a more dysarthric or more of a slur to your speech. Um, it can affect the throat, so it can have more of a dysphonic or sound kind of like, um, I don't know how to explain that very well, but it, it can make your, your speech sound a little thicker because the, the vocal cords in the, 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 the throat doesn't move as nice and easy as it used to. So um, that would be the most obvious thing I would think of. So the question uh, was, in the video presentation, there was a comment about how the the pathway or the, the pathophysiology of MS is that it attacks the myelin, but also that it attacks the nerve fiber itself, meaning the axon. And that is true. What we've learned about MS with MRI is that when the myelin is damaged, the axon beneath it can start to wither away because it isn't, we don't know why that happens, but probably because it isn't protected as well and so the signal isn't being transducted as well, and the nerve starts to die off a little bit. And we know that because on MRI, we see these black holes is what they're called, but they're holes in the brain that occur almost, I wanna say it's like a stroke, but it's not a stroke. It's completely different etiology, but it's a hole where the, the nerve itself has basically sort of deteriorated. And we didn't really know that until MRI. So the theory has changed a little bit. And that's where we think the disease disability long term comes from, is when those black holes or the, the axon itself is started to be disintegrated or affected, is when the, the secondary progressive disease comes in. We've only learned that over the past 20 years. But so do you see these black holes on the MRI? Is it with or without contrast? It's without contrast. It's actually on the... Um, the T1 sequences, which MRI has many sequences that we look at. And when we're looking for active inflammation, we always look at the flare sequence or the T2 flare sequence. That, those were the sequences I showed in the images during this presentation. But there also is a sequence called T1, and that does demonstrate the black holes. So we don't see it in early MS. We see it in later MS. So, but yes, that's a wonderful question because we didn't know that for a long time. Um, the question for everybody is, does the number of lesions on the MRI correlate with the number of relapses or the number uh, or the severity of disability, I guess? The answer is no. <laughs> um, there are MRIs that look horrible, like the one I just showed you. I have no idea who that patient was. I, I just picked that picture because I thought it was a good illustration. But MRI can be horribly deceiving and look horrible like that and have very few clinical symptoms, Okay the opposite case can occur where the brain doesn't really look that bad. But the location of the lesion can be in the specific, precise location that it leaves you with a lot of disability. So 
patients who have brain stem or spinal cord lesions, and not a lot in the outer portions of the brain, can have a lot of disability and look really bad. And their brain doesn't look that bad. So it, it doesn't always correlate. But the reason we monitor MRI is because we want to see is there any new lesions that have had some sort of clinical correlation. Because there is a silent component to MS. Because every new lesion doesn't always have a symptom. So, not in my training or not in my career time. Um, I guess I should repeat, did everybody hear that question? Um, can we use combination therapy to improve the immune system fight against MS? Um, the, reason, the answer is no, we don't do that. Um, and the reason is because, for example, in the uh, Tysabri trial, those patients that developed PML were also on other therapies. Some of them had been on Avonex, okay? And some of them had been on other chemotherapy drugs for other conditions. And we think that that significantly increases the risk of infection. And so we're incredibly leery of exposing people to too many infections because brain infections are very serious. So we don't take that lightly. And most of the studies are, are, are compared against placebo. Um, there's very few trials that compare head-to-head -head against another product. But they do not allow people to be in studies with combination therapy for that reason, because of the risk of infection. So it's, 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 it's a logical thought, and a lot of people have discussed that. But in my training and in my career, and even, I think, in the 20 years that they've been available, people are just not doing that. I mean, I've, I've not seen that anywhere. So, And in fact, sometimes when we take people off of medication and we switch to something different, we give them a little bit of a washout period, meaning some time to get that drug out of their system so that that is not a risk. So Exercise. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's mentally therapeutic. It helps you sleep better. You feel better. And we think it keeps you ambulatory for longer. So thank you. That's, that's great. Can you still have MS if you don't have lesions on your brain? Probably not. Okay. That's, um, there is a condition called um, neuromyelitis optica, which is a variant of MS. It's not MS. But it is usually consists of spinal cord lesions with no lesions on the brain and optic nerves. So it's nerves of the eyes and spinal cord and nothing in the brain which it's very similar to MS, but if you have MS, you, you have something on your brain. So, in my opinion, is, in my opinion, is the sun better than vitamin D? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think it might be. I mean, look at the people that live close to the equator. They don't have this problem. So you kind of wonder, right? But we don't have that ability. We, we have, you know, how many months of cloudiness and no sunlight? And it makes us all depressed and cranky. But, I mean, it, it, it does make you wonder. But that's all we have is the vitamin D3 for oral supplement in this area of the country. So, How often? That's a hard question. How often it is, is it in the arms versus the legs or probably vice versa, the legs versus the arms or both? Um, I don't know that I've ever paid attention to that, truthfully. I think we notice when it's in the legs more often because it affects our walking. It affects our ambulation. But the arms are not taken lightly either. I mean, riding, we, we, driving. driving, everything we do. I mean, I don't, I don't really have an answer to that because I've never really paid attention to which is more prominent. For a lot of people, it affects one side of the body. So it's the arm and the leg on one side. So it's both. But is it just one arm or just one leg? I don't know which one's more common. MS is a complicated disease because everybody's different. Not one single person with MS looks like the next person. It's very variable, so, it's, which is a challenge. Does it have some, he wants to know, because the location of the lesions on MRI are so close to the ventricles in the center of the brain, does that mean that there's something having to do with what we ingest into our bodies and that it's crossing the blood-brain barrier somehow and affecting the brain in the center portions from something we ate? I don't know, I, I've never heard that, that theory. They're expensive. Has a, have a mm -hmm. But insurances a lot of times are, you know, people use their insurances to pay for those expensive things. So that's why they charge so much. Because insurance companies will pay the big bucks. And if you don't have insurance, or if your insurance won't pay, then you still got to pay the big bucks. So I, I, truthfully, I don't have a lot of knowledge about where the cheapest 
devices are located. I know there's just, you know, I, I refer people to medical device stores because they have the most options, but I don't know that, that you're right, they're not, they're not cheap. It's so true. In my practice, um, I don't want anyone, I, I don't let anybody not be on drug because they don't have insurance. There are so many resources. Most of these drug companies will make sure you get the drug. And, and most of them have assistance programs so that you can get it for free for a year or two, or you can pay, you have a $10 copay, or they, uh, most of these drug companies bend over backwards to get you on their, their therapies. I mean, my partner trained in inner city Chicago, and you know, he, he saw people who had no money, no place to live, and were getting drug. So these drug companies will make sure that you can get therapy if you have a diagnosis. So somebody who tells me because they don't have insurance, they're not gonna take their medication, I can't, I, that's not enough for me. I mean, I, I really do work very hard to get people on therapy because I really strongly believe that, you know, I don't want you to be disabled. So I, I, want, I want to make any opportunity to keep you functional and keep you living as long as possible. I think that's changing a lot now. I think one of the, one of the companies I know for sure absolutely will pay for your drug if you can't afford it. And in fact, actually two of the companies I know well. Yes, people who, with the injectables, yes. Since the orals have come available, I mean, I've, seen, I've only been here for a year, okay? So I've assumed a lot of people who have been in this community and had a diagnosis and you know, maybe they're just looking for a new neurologist. So yes, people that have had a long-term diagnosis and hated the injectables and couldn't deal with it, those people have been off of drug. I've tried to get them back on therapies. I really have because... Um, especially if they're coming in and they're already using a cane or they're already having you know, something going on or, or they're having relapses and they're still. I mean, the biggest thing is clinically how are they doing. If they're not having relapses anymore and they, they're, they're stable or they're maybe progressing a little bit, you know, that's going to be a different situation because these medications are approved for relapsing forms. So on paper, that is something we have to be careful about because if you're not having relapses anymore, it may not be covered. So these, these therapies are only studied in relapsing remitting cases. They're not studied in primary progressive. They're not studied in secondary progressive. So that's a little bit of an individualized case as well. But yes, if people have been off of the injectables, I am trying to get them back on these newer therapies. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay.